Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloodied but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Many of you may recognize this poem. It's entitled Invictus, written by William Ernst Henley. Henley uh, apparently wrote the sermon, or sorry, the poem, in his early teenage years after he was diagnosed with uh, tubercular arthritis, which caused his leg to have to be amputated just below the knee. He wrote many poems, and in all of them, they seem to hold a, a theme of inner strength. This is due to the adversities he faced when he was at such a young age, including the death of his father around the same time he wrote this poem. And I have to admit, I first heard this poem in high school, and part of it stuck with me. I'm sure if you had to guess, you'd probably mostly guess correctly which lines would stick to a, to a teenage boy's mind. I am the captain of, I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul. Now you don't know me all that well yet, but when I tell you these lines stuck with me, you should be impressed with Henley's writing. I was a terrible student in high school. The only other thing that stuck with me from high school is my beautiful wife. <laughs> but these lines made an impression on me in my early 20s. I often thought of them. And I had a certain amount of pride thinking about being the captain of my own soul. Jump ahead 20 years, I'm not only a Christian, but I'm also studying to become a pastor. And I look at these lines very differently. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, and as captain of my soul, I'm sailing someplace no soul should ever go. I've come to realize as captain, I'm the captain of a slave ship. And not just captain of this ship, but I'm also a slave to it. Now I should clarify a little bit. <clears throat> I am not a, a slave in the worldly sense. No person has ever owned me. And like the Jews in our gospel reading this morning, I'm sure all of you could probably say the same thing. In a worldly sense, you've never been slaves. But what Jesus says next convicts the Jews as well as us. Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. Now the Jews are right. In a worldly sense, they're not slaves, even if you take away the fact that they're most certainly slaves to Rome at the time that Jesus is speaking. Or forget about the 400 years they spent in slavery to Pharaoh. And you definitely don't want to think about the exile to Babylon. But in a worldly sense, they're not slaves, I guess but they are most certainly slaves to sin. This is actually true of all of us. St. Paul makes it very clear in chapter 2 of Romans that all of us are born knowing right from wrong. All of us are born with the law written on our hearts. That is why every society in all of history has had laws about not murdering. This is why every time you lie or when you cheat, or when you steal, or when you are insulting to somebody, you feel guilty. So when Jesus says, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, he means everyone. In sin did my mother conceive me. In sin I was brought into this world, and in sin do I subsist. Which means, I am a slave to sin. So if then I am the master of my fate and the captain of my soul, I'm naturally on a slave ship because sin begets sin. Even the arrogance of these lines, I am the captain of my soul? I am the reason Jesus had to die. You are the reason Jesus had to die. 
chief of sinners though I am, chief of sinners though you are, there is forgiveness. There is freedom. Freedom from the law. Freedom from sin, which, magnif- which is magnified by the law. This freedom is earned for everyone who is under the law and a slave to sin. Yet only the disciple of Christ is set free. A disciple of Christ, that's you, that's me, a disciple of Christ abides in his word. And they know the truth, that's Jesus, and the truth, that's Jesus again, will set you free. But our freedom is not free of charge. Make no mistake, you didn't pay for it. Nothing you've done, no money you've spent, no work you have done has merited your freedom. But it cost Jesus a great deal. He didn't buy our freedom with gold or silver, but with his holy, innocent blood. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his only Son, so that whoever believes in him should not be a slave to sin, should not die to sin, but they should be set free. And whoever believes in him will live forever in the glory of God. For God loved the world in this way, that he gave his Son to be born of human flesh. He gave his Son to live in service of the Father perfectly. He gave his Son to take on the sins of the entire world. Your sins and my sins. Every sin means every single sin for all eternity. He gave his Son so that he could be beaten and bloody and die on our behalf. But you know that's not the end. He didn't stay dead. Because God loved the world in this way. That he gave his only son, that whoever should believe in him should have a resurrection, just like Jesus was revived and resurrected three days later. So that you as disciples may do the same. And it is here that the son, in his life, death, and resurrection sets us free so that we are free indeed. That doesn't mean you are free to sin as you will. Since we are observing Reformation Day, maybe one quote from Luther would be appropriate. Luther says, Christ has made us free not politically nor in the flesh, but theologically or spiritually. That is, we are free because our conscience has found peace and freedom without fear of the wrath to come. In our current state, our flesh is still under the penalty that the law, good and right law of God has. Our flesh, still condemned, is going to die. But our consciences do not need to fear the repercussions of the sinful nature in which we live. Luther continues his thought, With respect to our bodies sown in corruption, dishonor, and illness, God will set it free, resurrecting it incorruptible in power and glory. Luther then tells us why this statement is trustworthy. It was no emperor, neither patriarch nor prophet, nor any angel from heaven that attained this freedom for us. But Jesus Christ, the Son of God, for whom all things were created in heaven and in earth. Henley's poem is one I will remember from time to time, but as I said, I look at it in a very different light now. I don't have any personal inner strength of my own. I don't need it. My strength comes from Christ. I don't want to be the captain of my soul anymore. As a matter of fact, I'm a little afraid to be. Henley's poem, though written well, I wish was rewritten. I wish it was entitled Christus Victor and sounded something similar to this. Out of the sin that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank the just God who forgives me for the sake of Christ's sacrificial role. In the fell clutch of law's demand, Christ did not waver nor submit. Under the bludgeoning of Satan's hand, our Lord was bloodied but did not quit. Beyond this veil of pain and tears looms but the righteousness of God's wrath. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall ever find Christ's only path. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. 
Christ is the master of our fate. Christ is the captain of our soul. Amen. Now may the peace of God that surpasses all understanding sail your soul until Christ brings it home. Amen.